Hi, and welcome to Rev. Collins Reflections and Wingham United Church. This service has been prepared for October the 18th, 2020. Our call to worship today is uh, Psalm 99, verses 1 to 3. The Lord is King, let the peoples tremble. He sits enthroned upon the cherubim, let the earth quake. The Lord is great in Zion, he is exalted over all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name, holy is he. Come, let us praise our awesome God this day. We light the Christ candle as a temporary sign of the constant presence of Jesus. Let's pray. Holy God, you are with us here in this sanctuary and in our homes. Wherever the faithful turn their hearts to you, we sense your presence. Yet we cannot see your face nor fully understand your ways. You are more mystery than known. We know that seeing you fully is beyond our human limitations. Yet we come seeking a better understanding of our relationship with you, our place in your creation, and the path you would have us travel. And so with humble hearts and curious minds, we say the word Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our opening hymn today is one uh, a little younger at heart than many of the ones we've sung in recent weeks. It's number 289 in Voices United. It only takes a spark. Hello again, and welcome to Brother Bear's study. Uh, we really do worship an awesome, mighty God. But I think we have a tendency to think of God as warm and cuddly and somewhat benign. We think of Jesus in terms of those old paintings of a, a somewhat feminine looking European man surrounded by little children and lambs. And we do our best to set aside the vision of the fierce, passionate Christ overturning the tables in the temple. I think our, our scriptures today remind us of the power and majesty of God and of our real place 
in our relationship with the divine. Let's begin with a word of prayer. Almighty God, holy mystery, you have hidden us in a cleft to protect us from that which is too great to bear. Yet we come seeking knowledge and understanding so that we can better follow your way and your will. In these passages of scripture and in the meditation that follows, may we gain insight that will guide our lives and bring healing to our world. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be guided and inspired by you, O Lord, our strength and our hope. Amen. And so we begin with a passage from the book of Exodus, chapter 33, verse 12 to 23. Moses said to the Lord, See, you have said to me, Bring up this people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. Yet you have said, I know you by name, and you have also found favor in my sight. Now, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways, so that I may know you and find favor in your sight. Consider, too, that this nation is your people. God said, My presence will go with you, and I will give you rest. And Moses said to him, If your presence will not go, do not carry us up from here. For how shall it be known that I have found favor in your sight, I and your people, unless you go with us? In this way we shall be distinct, I and your people, from every people on the face of the earth. The Lord said to Moses, I will do the very thing that you have asked, for you have found favor in my sight, and I know you by name. Moses said, Show me your glory, I pray. And God said, I will make all my goodness pass before you and will proclaim before you the name the Lord and I will gracious I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show mercy on whom I will show mercy but he said you cannot see my face for no one shall see me and live and the Lord continued see there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock and while my glory passes by, I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back, but my face shall not be seen. Now we move to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 22, verse 15 to 22, where, as so often happens in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus finds himself squared off against the Pharisees. Then the Pharisees went and plotted to entrap him in what he said. So they sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians, saying, Teacher, we know that you are sincere and teach the way of God in accordance with truth and show no deference to anyone, for you do not regard people with partiality. Tell us then what you think. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? But Jesus, aware of their malice, said, Why are you putting me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin used for the tax. And they brought him a denarius. Then he said to them, Whose head is this and whose title? They answered, The emperor's. Then he said to them, Give therefore to the emperor the things that are the emperor's, and to God the things that are God's. When they heard this, they were amazed. And they left him and went away. Here ends today's scripture readings. May they bring us wisdom and insight. Well, they're at it again. The Pharisees are out to corner Jesus in a no-win situation so they can use his own words against him. This time they've brought along some unlikely allies, the Herodians. The Herodians were Jews who supported the reign of the Rome-appointed king. Some might call them collaborators. The Pharisees and Herodians have a common objective here, though, discrediting and getting rid of Jesus. Once again, however, Jesus outsmarts them. Their plan was supposed to be foolproof. Is it lawful for faithful Jews to pay taxes? Now, you need to understand something here. Roman emperors expected to be worshipped as gods, or at least as demigods interpreted a certain way, both the first and second commandments 
forbid the paying of taxes because uh, A, God is a jealous God and will not tolerate worship of other gods. And B, the Roman coin bore the graven image of the emperor, which made it in their eyes an idol. So paying taxes was, to the ancient Jews, paying tribute to a false god using a graven image. If Jesus answered according to this line of thought, the Herodians would have him right where they wanted him. They could accuse him of sowing sedition against the empire, and Jesus would surely be arrested and tried under Roman law. If he answered that paying taxes was lawful, then the Pharisees could accuse him of heresy or blasphemy, and he would be charged and tried under Jewish temple law. Either way, they had him cornered, or so they thought. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what belongs to God. Well, jaws drop. They hadn't thought of that one. Now they're stumped and they slink off to come up with another plan. We should make a distinction now between taxes in the time of Christ and taxes today. Under the imperial system, taxes were collected from the conquered and depressed and, and used to subjugate the very people who paid them. Uh, taxes were often punitive and primarily used to pay for military forces, which made occupation of foreign lands and their exploitation possible. They were also often paid as tribute to the emperor, which could be interpreted as a form of worship, although they were rarely free will offerings. Uh, tribute was paid to prevent the emperor from sending troops to pillage and destroy. Our taxes today are better seen as payment for services rendered. We don't pay them as acts of worship to either the queen or the polar bear. We want luxuries like passable roads, health care, education, law and order and security, and taxes are how we pay for those things. Now, the efficiency or integrity with which the funds are spent is a conversation I'll leave for the coffee crowd to discuss. Uh, the, the simple fact is that if we want these services, we have to pay for them. And so taxation is inevitable. The greater question, however, for us as Christians, and the side of the coin that is often overlooked, is whether or not we give to God the things that are God's. And how do we decide what those things are? Now, I'm not talking about your church offering now. Although I think a strong argument could be made for that being part of the equation. However, God expects more. All that we have, all that we are, comes from God. It all belongs to God. Now, when you take a minute to contemplate the magnitude of that statement, it can overwhelm. All that we have and all that we are belongs to God. Everything we have, even life itself, is on loan. Give to God the things that are God's takes on a whole new importance when you reach that realization. Now, while you mull that over, I would like to set another scene. Moses has gone into Egypt and brought God's chosen people out of slavery and into the wilderness. Now, faced with a, a very uncertain future and the responsibility of looking after millions of people in a land without reliable supplies of food and water, Moses starts to question who exactly it was that brought him here. In truth, he doesn't know all that much about God. A voice spoke to him from a burning bush, and that was enough for a while. But now he needs more. The last time he asked, the answer was, I am. Not much to go on. So he asks, if I have found favor in your sight, show me your ways so that I may know you. God assures him that God will go with him, but Moses wants more than assurances. He wants something more tangible. When the people started asking questions, Moses would like to have some answers. And God relents. Moses will get to do what no one else has ever done. He will see God. 
but not a face-to-face -face meeting. No one could survive such a revelation. Moses will hide his face in a cleft in the face of the mountain, and God will shield him while God's goodness passes by, and then allow him to see God from behind as God moves away. Now, when you think of it, isn't that the way we usually see God? Not in the approach, but in the aftermath. We see the effect of God's passing as we look back and reflect on things that have happened. In hindsight, we see how certain people came into our lives just when we needed them. Or something happened at just the right time that made such a difference. Just when we needed that call from a friend or someone posts something on Facebook that just hits us right when and where we needed those words. A sudden urge to turn left instead of right helps us avoid an accident. We don't see these things coming and usually don't even realize when they happen until we think about it later and see how all the pieces somehow fell, somehow fell into place to get us to where we are now. Or on the other side of that same coin, we realize that there have been times when we felt a call to do something but resisted. And now looking back, wished we had done it. Now, God is right there all the time, shielding us from a truth we cannot bear to see, but still guiding us in the way we should go. Whether we get there or not <laughs> depends on whether we give to God the things that are God's. If our lives are God's, then it only makes sense that God wants us to live those lives well with joy and contentment. So giving our lives to God, or back to God, really, means allowing God to bless us even more in return. The trouble comes from the fact that we have done our very best to domesticate the untamable. We have tried to put the force that created all there is into a box that we can comprehend and control. We've, we've buried our face in the cleft in the rock, but then refused to look when God said it was okay. Much about God will always be a mystery. That will never change. And who would wish it otherwise? Could anything that we could fully know and understand be worthy of our worship? However, I believe God reveals much more to us than many of us are willing to see. The Spirit speaks to us, but we ignore it. A blessing arrives, but we fail to accept it. We take credit for our success and blame God for the things that go wrong when we refuse to listen. We have watered down God into the image of a sort of Santa Claus figure. And when we pray, it's as though we're sitting on his knee and telling him what we want, rather than accepting that this is the almighty God, creator of the universe, far beyond our control or wisdom. The truth is too much for us to bear. So God graciously and patiently reveals to us only what we are ready and able to comprehend. To get our lives and our world back on the right path, we must once again worship God as free, untamed, and powerful. Proverbs 9 verse 10 states, Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. Now, I've talked with people who don't like to use the word fear when they talk about God, that, who say they don't fear God because they think of God as a friend. But I think God is far more grizzly bear than teddy bear. If we refuse to give to God the things that are God's, God could easily decide to take it back and begin again. Scripture tells us that it has happened before. So like Moses, we must pursue a greater knowledge of the true nature of God as much as we can know and understand, and then repay what we have on loan by working to restore creation. We don't only borrow all that is from its creator, we also borrow from the generations that will follow. 
Let's pray. Almighty God, source of life, all that creates, all that exists is your creation, spoken into existence. Incredibly, you love us and call us to love and serve you with body, mind, and spirit by sharing your love with our brothers and sisters throughout creation. With grateful hearts, we acknowledge your guiding spirit and seek insight and wisdom in following where you would lead us and awareness of your blessings and presence in our day-to-day -day lives. God of mercy and healing, we know you hear the cries of all those in need. We add our prayers for all who are troubled and ailing of body, mind, or spirit this day, that they may know peace, comfort, and courage. In these moments of silent reflection, we bring to mind those we know in particular need of your presence this day. Holy, loving God, show us how we may be instruments of your peace, healing, and compassion. Make us faithful stewards of the fragile bounty of this earth, that we may be entrusted with the riches of heaven. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, let's go back into the sanctuary now for our closing hymn, number 506 from Voices United, Take My Life and let it be. Jesus told his listeners to give to God what belongs to God. We do that not only with the gifts of our hands, but also with the gifts of our whole lives, lived according to our divine purpose. In support of the ministries of our various communities of faith, we give a little of this worldly wealth to God, hoping that it will become a divine blessing as it is shared. Let's pray. All we have, O oh God, is yours entrusted to us as stewards of your creation. We give thanks for these gifts and seek your guidance in their use to bless all your children in this community and across the globe. 
In Jesus' name, we pray for wisdom and inspiration. Amen. In the days ahead, take stock of the things in your life that belong to God and seek God's guidance in how those blessings should be repaid. Give to God what belongs to God and you will find so much more will be given in return. And so we extinguish the Christ candle's flame so that we may be bearers of the light of Christ in the world around us. May the love of God, the grace of Christ Jesus, and the presence of the Holy Spirit hold you and guide your steps this day and always. Amen.